of neurologists in the country as physicians too will benefit out of it. So the topic for today's discussion is uh, dimethyl fumarate. We'll go through this drug uh, as per the spot uh, following uh, aspects. Let us see what the drug is. It's pharmacology, it's positioning in multiple sclerosis. We'll look at uh, relevant data from important trials, then how and when to use it, adverse effects, monitoring therapy. Now we have generic molecules. Let us see how they fare with the originals and a brief comparison with other DMDs and what is the future of dimethyl fumarate. I'll refer to dimethyl fumarate as DMF throughout this talk. Uh, it's a ester of fumaric acid. Now fumaric acid occurs widely in nature. It has a fruity taste and has been used as a food additive. Uh, our normal human skin produces fumaric acid when exposed to sunlight. And it's a component of the uh, citric acid cycle and the urea cycles. Uh, for the generation of adenosine triphosphate. Uh, the chemical name is dimethyl 2 and the, uh, It's classified as an immunomodulatory agent. It's not classified as an immunosuppressant agent, but as an immunomodulatory agent. The drug was first used as a powder in furniture and shoe industry to prevent fungal growth and keep things dry. But then it used to cause a lot of skin allergies in people who were, uh, you know, using these kind of uh, items, and then it was discontinued. The first medical use of fumaric acid was as a topical formulation for psoriasis in West Germany, and subsequently uh, uh, it was taken over by a, a Swiss uh, firm, and then they, it was licensed for use uh, in psoriasis in Germany and later in European Union in two uh, brand forms, Fumaderm and Scylarens. So these were topical uh, preparations. And then Biogen took over the uh, molecule and then they started uh, looking into the aspect of using it for multiple sclerosis. They codenamed it BG12. For a long time before it was approved, it was known as BG12. And then finally, when it got its approval, it was named as Tecfidera and we have a lot of uh, generic molecules in India also. It has been approved as a first line therapy in adults for RRMS. This was in 2013 in US. And subsequently, it is also approved for CIS and active forms of SPMS. So that will come to when we discuss multiple sclerosis briefly, uh, but not in all cases of SPMS. Now, uh, before we start discussing about the drug, we need to know what we are trying to do in multiple sclerosis. Uh, so this is a very brief uh, review of multiple sclerosis. It's a chronic autoimmune inflammatory demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system, that is the optic nerves, the brain, and the spinal cord. And uh, the disease often exists as what we know as, what we call as radiological isolated syndrome. And then it, when the first episode presents, it's known as a clinically isolated syndrome. And then it, it can have various progressions from there. In some people, it can be very mild, where it can, uh, it can be labeled as a benign MS. And in some people, it can be very aggressive, or what we call as fulminant MS. And the clinical course can be remitting relapsing. That means symptoms will come and go. There'll be some amount of uh, demyelination, inflammation, and then uh, recovery from there. Or there can be a progressive course. Course The progressive course can be either right from the day one, where it's known as primary progressive MS, or it can uh, evolve into a progression later. After the initial few years of uh, remitting relapsing course, it can get into a progressive mode, where it is known as secondary progressive MS. And often you find people who are stable and inactive. Inactive means there is no evidence of any disease activity during the last year. And there are many people who are stable. That's called a stable MS. So we need to figure out where somebody is in the spectrum of MS so that we can choose the right therapy. So as I said, a preclinical phase is called a radiological isolated syndrome. It may or may not be there in many patients. The first episode is called a clinically isolated syndrome or CAS. And this, this can evolve as either progressive MS or our RRMS. And in RRMS, you have disease come and go, coming and going, and then you know, the benign forms. And then when you treat RRMS, you have people with, people with mild disease where you maintain something called NADA, no evidence of disease activity. That is probably the target of treatment that we're looking for. And there might be some people who have a mild evidence of disease, and then people who have aggressive disease from onset. And here, probably the first line drugs may not be uh, really effective. Now, what is important is the disease has two basic components, inflammation and degeneration. 
as the disease begins there's a lot of inflammation in the central nervous system and as time evolves inflammation comes down and initially with inflammation the body also has lot of potential for remyelination and recovery as time evolves both of this reduce and then degeneration takes place this is when somebody evolves into a progressive phase which typically happens after 10 to 15 years and very often in people who are not being appropriately treated so this is about ms and where does dimethyl fumarate fit into this so uh, in cas form it is approved so if somebody decides to treat cas it's a good option benign ms one may or may not treat the early part of rrms this is where uh, dmf might play a big role it doesn't have any role in well established progressive form of ms and when there is lot of disease activity it is not that effective to control the disease so we have a narrow spectrum of uh, use for dmf what is the mechanism of action it is an immunomodulator with a very mild immunosuppressant effect the exact mechanism is not fully understood there is something called the nrf2 pathway uh, this is involved in cellular response to oxidative stress under normal conditions this is this nrf2 is retained in the cytoplasm and there is a molecule called keap1 which uh, which interacts with the nrf2 molecule now dimethyl fumarate quickly gets converted to monomethyl fumarate in the body mmf which binds to keap and it stabilizes the nrf2 and this is internalized inside the nucleus where it induces changes in the uh, genetic material primarily to produce an antioxidant response so it it has a gene modifying effect to have an antioxidant so this is the hypothesis of how dmf acts and probably in this process it inhibits inflammation and it helps in uh, you know repair and degeneration of damaged dna and modifies the uh, cellular metabolism as well okay so apart from this there are other immunological pathways also mmf that is monomethyl fumarate was found to affect other immunomodulatory responses particularly that which is mediate, mediated by the t helper cells and it also has an agonist action against nicotinic receptors in vitro now apart from this i, I think there's a sound somebody has to keep themselves mute we are hearing some tv noise in between yeah thank you uh, uh, apart from this dmf also impacts uh, uh, the mul multiple sclerosis pathophysiology at multiple points so it's not just the intracellular mechanism so it has a strong anti inflammatory immunomodulatory effect and a neuroprotective or cytoprotective action by various uh, mechanisms and there are a lot of data on that we'll not go into the details but basically it's a drug which uh, works at multiple levels uh, in the ms pathophysiology uh, uh, and the, the, the and the recovery process as well as the ongoing inflammatory process coming to clinical pharmacology uh dmf as i said is a precursor of uh, monomethyl fumarate mmf after oral intake dmf undergoes rapid hydrolysis by an esterase in the small intestine and it is converted to an active metabolite that is monomethyl fumarate and in in the process there is also formation of little bit of methanol and probably methanol is responsible for most of the uh, gi side effects of the drug and due to very rapid cleavage of dmf in the serum you can measure only mmf in circulation and uh, you may not be able to measure dmf of course there are some people who believe that you know the uh, the uh, dmf and mmf act synergistically to get the uh, therapeutic response but very often it is the action works through mmf intracellularly and the half life of mmf is about 1 hour and mmf is subsequently metabolized through the uh, tca cycle and is eliminated uh, eliminated mainly through uh, exhalation uh, of carbon dioxide hello yeah and a minor part of uh, this undergoes renal and fecal elimination so bulk of the uh, drug is metabolized through tca cycle and is eliminated through respiration now uh, what happens to methanol methanol which is a by product of this whole process is metabolized to formic acid which is the main cause for gi side effects which are very common with the drug methanol in high systemic concentration causes minimal side effects it can lead to if it is in very high concentration can lead to blindness we are all familiar with huge tragedies in our country it can lead to organ failure and even death but in therapeutic doses with dmf the amount of methanol which is formed is within safety limits 
as per the US FDA and European Food Safety Authority. So it doesn't lead to uh, therapeutic uh, toxicity except for GI side effects. Now, what is the effect of food on DMF? The drug is completely absorbed in two to two and a half hours. Uh, but if somebody has a high fat, high calorie diet, uh, it, it doesn't affect the overall area under the curve of absorption, but it decreases the peak plasma concentration by 40 percentage. And there's a delay to the, uh, the delay in the time taken to achieve peak concentration. This goes up to five hours. So to reduce the side effects, to prevent the peak from happening, the drug is best taken with uh, food. And, and it was found that the incidence of that one major side effect of uh, DMF is flushing, which I'll come to in a moment. Flushing incidence reduces rapid, uh, quite dramatically if it is taken with food. And it was found to uh, come down in almost 25% of patients when the drug is taken with food. Now, uh, the, the dosage is uh, 120 milligrams twice daily for a week when you begin with. And after a week, the dose is increased to 240 milligrams. But generally, there is no need for adjustment of the dose based on somebody's body weight, gender, or age. Because the metabolism is uh, primarily, it is going out through the body's natural cycles and then through the, uh, 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 through the lungs. So no studies have been conducted in subjects with hepatic or renal impairment. But generally, it is not going to get affected. But it is better to avoid a DMF in patients with quite severe uh, dysfunction of liver and kidneys. Uh, coming to drug interactions, there's no potential drug interaction with uh, DMF or MMF. Uh, this was seen in various uh, experiments in vitro, uh, cytochrome P450 inhibition and induction studies, as well as in P glycoprotein studies. Now, when uh, aspirin is one drug which is often administered along with uh, DMF to prevent the side effects, aspirin has no alteration in pharmacokinetics of uh, MMF. Com uh, coming to oral contraceptive pills, the uh, combination of uh, some OCPs has not been affected, but there are uh, no studies on progestogens, but the estradiol OCP combined pills probably are quite okay to be used along with DMF. Vaccination is a big contention. Now we are all hoping for a vaccine for COVID. Uh, generally, the killed vaccine should be okay when somebody is on DMF and the live vaccines have not been tested, but because of its effect on the immune system and uh, depletion of the lymphocytes, it is not advisable to give somebody a live vaccine when they are on DMF. Uh, but there's no uh, attenuation in antibody responses when somebody is injected with the killed vaccines like TT or uh, pneumococcal or meningococcal vaccines. Uh, what are the other toxicities which can happen? Also, uh, the, the studies have come mostly from uh, mice experiments. Uh, there is no carcinogenicity associated with uh, the drug in the therapeutic doses. There's something called recommended human dose. This is a dose which is uh, titrated in mice. And, and there is no uh, risk of cancer with uh, the routine doses which uh, humans take. But in higher doses, there's an increased risk of stomach and kidney tumors. Having said that, uh, DMF is also under trials for various kinds of uh, cancer. So probably it also has a potential anti-neoplastic effect. Coming to infertility, we have a lot of issues in patients with MS as far as their fertility is concerned. Uh, in routine therapeutic doses, the RH, the recommended human dose, no adverse effects were found on sperms. But in uh, dogs, in higher doses, testicular toxicity and non-motile sperms were detected. And in uh, mice with uh, higher doses, disruption of estrus cycle and increase in embryo toxicity was found at double the expected dosage. And with very high doses, nephrotoxicity and retinal degeneration in animals have been uh, reported. Now, are there any contraindications to this drug? It's Generally, there are no contraindications. It's a good drug. Uh, unlike the interferons, which we know comes with a lot of uh, allergic phenomenon and uh, you know fever and other things, this drug doesn't have that many problems. But it can cause anaphylaxis, particularly after the first few doses and angioedema. And the drug has to be promptly stopped if this happens. Uh, although it is very rare, I have seen only one case who had intense skin reactions with this drug with a lot of erythematous rashes, but not seen anybody develop an anaphylactic uh, reaction. Nevertheless, we need to keep this in mind as one of the possible complications. Coming to other uh, common side effects, flushing is an important side effect of uh, DMF. 
In clinical trials, up to 40% of patients experience flushing, and the symptoms generally uh, begin soon after starting the medicine, maybe in the first few days of uh, titrating the dose. Uh, the mechanism is that MMF stimulates prostaglandin production, which signal capillaries to open, and that causes a lot of flushing. And generally, it tends to improve over time, and the symptoms are mild or moderate, and most people tend to get used to it, or it reduces with uh, time. And it occurs about 15 to 20 minutes after ingestion of DMF. And the symptoms that people describe is a feeling of warmth or redness over the upper part of the body and face. And they may feel some pricking sensation or tingling over the face as well. So how to counter this? So administration of DMF with food, preferably a fatty or protein rich fruit, is particularly useful to reduce uh, flushing. And aspirin, not the entry coated aspirin, the, the conventional aspirin, in a dose of 75 to 325 milligram, if taken 30 minutes before DMF, can help to reduce flushing. The enteric coated aspirin is typically released in the uh, large intestine, and that probably doesn't counter the effect, and it's slow to get absorbed. That doesn't counter the uh, side effects of DMF. The other common side effects are gastrointestinal symptoms, which happen in about 20% of patients. And the, the common symptoms are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, gas, bloating, or abdominal pain, and usually gets better in six to eight weeks after continuation of the therapy. And the side effects are primarily due to uh, uh, methanol as one of the breakdown products. Now, we need to keep in mind that methanol is also generated after intake of aspartame. You know, aspartame is an artificial sweetener found in food and many soft drinks. So uh, people need to be warned about uh, potential possibility of uh, symptoms getting worse when they take uh, this kind of artificial sweetener along with DMF. Now, the uh, flushing and gastrointestinal adverse effects can be managed to a great extent by, I'm repeating this again, by taking the tablet with food initially. And if things are quite permissible, they can take it after food also. But in spite of this, if the symptoms are quite persistent, uh, a good method is to reduce the dose. Sometimes we even do it uh, at a smaller uh, titration, 150 milligram once a day for a week, and then go to 120 milligrams twice a week, and then gradually step up to 240 milligram twice a day. In trials, people have gone up to 240 uh, thrice a day as well, but the recommended dosage is 240 milligrams twice a day. And once we, for some reason, if we reduce the dosage, then we should try to restore it back to the therapeutic dosage at least by a month, so that you know we have a good control over the disease. Liver injury is yet another uh, toxicity. Uh, it starts in days to months after DMF. And what we have seen is most people have asymptomatic increase in the liver enzymes. There probably nothing needs to be done, uh, you know, but it's always worthwhile to have a, a gastroenterologist to review if the liver enzymes are going up. But generally, if the bilirubin is double the upper limit of normal, or the liver enzymes are more than thrice the upper limit of normal, then it is better to stop the drug because these are indicators of uh, further liver uh, injuries. And, and generally, the abnormalities resolve on discontinuation of the treatment. So the, uh, the, the, the monitoring protocol is to check liver functions prior to starting treatment and during treatment as clinically indicated. So generally, we do after two to three months uh, after starting DMF along with the uh, blood uh, counts as well. And then if things are fine, we just continue the treatment. Up to three times increase in liver enzymes uh, is still acceptable. Uh, and then we just, if the patient is asymptomatic, bilirubin is normal, the drug can still be continued. Now, uh, many people with uh, multiple sclerosis also take biotin, the high dose of biotin. And biotin also interferes with uh, some of the uh, uh, lab parameters. And you know if you're going to check the liver, uh, it's probably advisable to stop the biotin for a week or so, and then uh, check the liver functions. Lymphopenia is one of the biological effects of the drug, and probably it is how the, the, the medicine works for MS. Uh, mean lymphocyte counts in trials were found to be 30% less in the first year of treatment with DMF, and it remained stable at that level. Now, after stopping DMF, the lymphocyte counts increased but it didn't return to baseline. But there are studies which have shown that, uh, you know, the lymphocytes ultimately, they, they are not knocked off permanently, so they come back. And the effect is probably much less than what you see with the drug like fingolimod. 
and uh, what is the impact of lymphopenia we are all scared about lymphopenia because it's going to trigger infections of course there's a risk of infection but in the trials it was found that the incidence of minor infections between dmf and placebo who had lymphopenia was almost uh, similar and serious infections in both the groups was about 2 percentage so how do we monitor the lymphocyte counts now if uh, generally along with the liver functions after two or three months of the first uh, of initiating dmf we check the complete blood count along with the absolute lymphocyte count and the liver functions and if it is fine we monitor it after four months and subsequently once in six months to a year so generally most of the follow ups are done at six months and uh, it's always advisable to get the uh, blood parameters done once in six months <coughs> now uh, the absolute lymphocyte counts normally are between 1000 to 4000 uh, per cubic millimeter and if the counts are less than 800 that needs little bit of caution and close monitoring probably monthly monitoring of the absolute lymphocyte counts now uh, so if mmf is act going to act or dmf is going to act through the lymphocytes can the absolute lymphocyte count be used as a marker to check whether uh, you know dmf effect is coming up or not you can't uh, do an mri very often but it was found that the uh, dmf mediated changes in absolute lymphocyte count was not associated with any greater clinical efficacy i mean those who had to have relapses did have relapses in irrespective of the lymphocyte counts and the serum neurofilament light also didn't change in respect to the absolute lymphocyte count so therefore you can't use absolute lymphocyte count as a marker for the response to dmf so you have to look at the other parameters to see the clinical response maybe uh, I'll, i'll come to that when we look at the monitoring aspects other important complications are various kinds of infections and pml is one serious infection that all of us are scared scared about and the, the pml is more often described with uh, natalizumab but in patients who were on dmf with uh, persistent lymphocyte count below 800 for more than 6 months were at risk of contracting pml the other infections which were described in trials were uh, disseminated herpes infections meningoencephalitis meningomyelitis and various other kinds of viral infections bacterial infections particularly nocardia and listeria infections tubercular infections but fortunately you know in spite of having a, a, a potentially infectious uh, surroundings in our country the rate of infections in uh, patients on dmf that i am seeing is not that bad we see more often with rituximab than with uh, uh, dmf so what what do you do when you find somebody with the infection you uh, withhold the treatment till the infection is controlled and then reassess the uh, uh, treatment options with strict monitoring now pml risk monitoring is something very very important and uh, it's needed in people who have lymphopenia we need an ex- enhanced vigil to look for the risk of pml so if uh, patients have severe lymphopenia less than less than 500 uh, uh, cells per millimeter cube for more than 6 months then the risk goes much higher so here you need to stop the drug if it is between 500 to 800 and if it is sustained for six, more than 6 months then one needs to assess the risk versus benefit of uh, continuation of the therapy and then take a call on a case to case basis and uh, upon recovery once you have stopped the drug upon recovery one needs to again decide whether to continue with dmr for change to a different uh, disease modifying therapy to monitor the risk when somebody's count is low we need to do it more often check the complete blood count and lymphocyte counts before initiating treatment and uh, we do it more often 2 to 3 months after the uh, initial uh, therapy and then once in 6 months to 12 year uh, 12 months a very rare complication is fanconi syndrome uh, which is manifest as uh, proteinuria and glycose glucosuria with normal blood sugar and generally people have polyuria polydipsia and proximal muscle weakness very much like uh, ms fatigue and uh, you know uh, sometimes as non specific uh, symptoms so it's important to recognize uh, and uh, you know this as a possibility in ms patients on dmf who have uh, severe fatigue and proximal weakness and keep this in mind so that this is a potentially reversible condition and even and creatinine also sometimes will be normal and before somebody gets into serious consequences like renal impairment stopping the drug can be of uh, help there are other adverse effects seen in clinical trials uh, which are not very common uh, even in clinical practice we don't see that many side effects with this drug 
Uh, what I have mentioned is the one that uh, the common ones, the GI side effects and flushing. These are the two primary side effects that we need to keep in mind. Now, is there a risk of overdose? Unlike anti-epileptic drugs, DMF doesn't have, of course, many MS patients are depressed, but the DMF doesn't come with a, a label of, uh, you know, pushing somebody to, uh, you know, self-harm. Uh, of course, uh, when somebody takes overdose uh, for some reasons, the symptoms would be mainly gastrointestinal and flushing. Hepatic dysfunction needs to be uh, looked into. But there's no specific antidote. One needs to wait for the drug effect to uh, wear off. Now, coming to uh, the role of drug in pregnancy and lactation, there's no adequate data on the developmental risk associated with use of DFMF in pregnancy. Of course, there are uh, reports here and there where people have been on DMF and accidentally had pregnancies, and many of them have done well. But there is no strong recommendation that this is a drug which can be used safely in pregnancy. In animals, there have been problems with, uh, you know, in animal studies, the drug has caused problems in the offspring survival, the growth of the fetus, sexual maturation, and uh, behavioral function. Uh, again, when it comes to uh, breastfeeding, uh, there is no a strong recommendation that it can be continued. But generally what we do is when somebody is feeding, we tend to avoid the uh, uh, DMTs so that the benefit of lactation against uh, MS is still there. And once somebody starts uh, you know, weaning, then we start the medicines. But as of now, there's no uh, a green signal for use of DMF when somebody is uh, feeding the baby. Uh, coming to pediatric age group, again, there's lot, not much of data, but there are a few uh, studies which have looked into the aspects and found that it is okay to use the drug without any new warnings in children. But less than 10 years, there is no data on uh, use of DMF. We have used it in children with uh, a reasonable benefit as it would have happened in adults. Coming to elderly, again, very little data because MS primarily affects a relatively younger age. Uh, but based on its mechanism of action, there is no uh, reason why it shouldn't be used in elderly population. Coming to the use of alcohol, I said that methanol is one of the uh, derivatives or one of the metabolites which comes out of uh, this drug. So one has to be careful when uh, somebody is on DMF and consumes alcohol because of increased frequency of GI adverse effects. So if somebody consumes large quantities of alcohol, particularly if it is highly concentrated, then they're likely to have more GI side effects. And if somebody is very particular, then probably a gap of an hour or so uh, between alcohol and uh, DMF should be uh, advised. Now, how to use the drug? What is the uh, prescription plan? So typically, the drug is used as 20, 120 milligrams twice daily for the first week to be taken along with food. And subsequently, the dose, the dose is increased to 240 milligrams twice daily, and that is continued. There's no end point of treatment here because, as you know, MS is a disease which requires long-term treatment. It's, it's just like treating uh, epilepsy. You know, you, you try drugs and see if uh, there are side effects, you change to another drug. And if the seizures don't get control, you add more drugs or, uh, you know, look for a more efficacious drug. MS is in many ways similar to treating epilepsy. You start on the therapy and if things go well, you maintain on the therapy. And then if somebody doesn't maintain NADA, you look at escalation options. And if somebody doesn't uh, tolerate the medicine, look at other first-line drugs so that uh, you know uh, the side effects can be overcome. Now, what will you do if a dose is missed? This is uh, a common problem in MS. Many people forget to take their dosages because otherwise they are okay during the day. So a double dose should not be taken. And if they remember that they are not taken the dose within four hours of the uh, scheduled dosage, they can take that dosage. Otherwise, it's better to give at least four hours gap between subsequent dosages. Coming to efficacy, there have been various trials uh, of uh, DMF. Before that, let me classify the, uh, uh, the drugs as uh, first line, second line, and others. So the first line drugs, I mean, it, it's, it's also possible that a drug from this group can be used as a first agent. So by first line, what we mean is drugs which are relatively safe in their side effect profile. And with that, they're also relatively weak as far as, as, far as their efficacy is concerned. And this includes all the interferons, glatiramer, teriflunamide, as well as dimethylfumarate. The more effective agents can be called as the second line drugs. And in many instances, we may use one of the second line drugs as a first uh, agent in a given patient. This includes drugs like uh, fingolimod and cladribin as oral medicines. 
natalizumab and melantuzumab and uh, ocrelizumab as well and of course we have got uh, the the other drugs like uh, the various uh, drugs similar to fingolimod in their action lacunamod ozanimod and siponimod which is also now approved for progressive ms so uh, among the first line drugs dmf seems to be a good choice for many patients because of its uh, efficacy advantages as well as its uh, relatively uh, safe side effect profile one of the studies which came up with uh, you know uh, positive aspects of dmf is the defined study so here close to uh, 400 patients were enrolled in as placebo then into a twice daily dosage and then a thrice daily dos dosage and it was found that those who were on dmf fared much much better uh, compared to those who were on the placebo and if you look at the annualized uh, relapse rate at 2 years uh, those who were on dmf bad or tad dose fared much better than the placebo and if you look at the mri uh, uh, changes when you compare placebo to dmf there were reductions in uh, uh, new lesions the enhancing lesions also came down and there was a reduction in new t1 lesions also suggesting that the drug has uh, Uh, a very good radiological impact which uh, indicates that overall efficacy of the drug is quite uh, uh, supreme now when the no evidence of disease activity parameters were looked at at 2 years again it was found that uh, dmf is much superior to uh, placebo now uh, there has been an extended trial of the cohorts in define from define and confirm this were the other trials where dmf was uh, looked into and uh, this is called the endos trial which was uh, recently published and here it was found that there is a sustained safety and efficacy of dmf in patients continuing on the treatment up to even 10 years or 11 years and this supported dmf as long term treatment options for patients with rrms we know that drugs like glatiramer and many interferons have stood the test of time and we have more than 20 to 30 years of experience with those drugs but then they have their own uh, problems with the injectables the adverse effects so dmf has evolved as a great replacement for the injectable first line drugs now how to monitor therapy uh, so we have looked at the monitoring of side effects is also important to monitor the efficacy of therapy so the efficacy of therapy is monitored by the concept of nada no evidence of disease activity so somebody shouldn't have any uh, clinical relapses there should not be any progression of disability and the mri wise there should not be any new lesions or new changes in the mr it's are the primary three criteria of nada which we routinely practice in uh, uh, in our uh, routine clinical practice but then uh, other aspects of nada is brain atrophy as well as cognitive dysfunction uh, this also uh, is important part of uh, you know monitoring ms patients now before initiating treatment with uh, dmf it is always important to have a baseline mri to uh, look at uh, you know so that uh, when we do subsequent mrs we have something to compare with and if this is done within the last 3 months of initiating dmf that should be quite useful as a reference but if it is not there probably with the financial issues we may not really uh, do an mri again at the time of initiation initiation of therapy but we need to have two other mrs to uh, monitor subsequent uh, progression of the disease and once we start the medicine we can do a follow up mri any time after 6 months to 12 months uh, so that we are looking at any radiological progression to see that uh, nada is maintained and this is particularly important important if somebody has uh, high uh, uh, mri lesion load and you are choosing dmf as the choice of drug rather than a more effective second line drug so here uh, a more frequent mri is important so that you know you don't miss the bus of choosing a more powerful agent and if there are risk factors for development of pml for example somebody has uh, had persistent low lymphocyte counts or has received immunosuppressive therapy previously then more often a screening mri is sufficient and one needs to monitor the clinical symptoms sometimes the symptoms of ms and pml may be quite similar so mri might help in uh, uh, in in distinction between these two now how does dmf compare with the other dmds that we have a uh, clinical experience suggests that dmf may be more effective than teriflunamide as far as the efficacy is concerned and it is better tolerated than fingolimod so fingolimod if you look at the efficacy is slightly superior to uh, dmf 
How does BMF compare with teriflunamide? You know, teriflunamide is also available as a generic and it is approved as a first-line agent. So in this study, it was found that uh, uh, if you look at the uh, discontinuation rate due to breakthrough disease, it was much lower for DMF compared to teriflunamide. And therefore, DMF was more effective in preventing relapses and has lower discontinuation rate due to breakthrough disease when compared with teriflunamide. Now, teriflunamide also comes with certain other uh, peculiar side effects. It stays in the circulation for a long time, uh, pregnancy issues, and one may have to resort to accelerated clearance of the drug in pregnancy. So looking at all those aspects, when you look at uh, the use of oral medications, probably DMF scores higher than teriflunamide. When we look at the efficacy of DMF when compared to other agents, uh, it is certainly efficacious than teriflunamide, as I just explained, but it's probably effect uh, more effective than the other injectables like interferons and uh, glatinema. Now, uh, what is the future of DMF? So, although it looks pretty bright, it does have certain side effects, as I mentioned, the GI side effects and the flushing. So, there is one drug called deroximal uh, fumarate. Deroximal fumarate is, uh, again, uh, somewhat similar to DMF in many aspects, but it is a, it's something which gets uh, uh, converted to MMF in the body with very less methanol formation. So there are trials on deroximal, the evolved MS1 and evolved MS2, which showed that the drug is as comparable as DMF as far as efficacy is concerned and uh, with mar markedly reduced uh, side effects. And uh, deroximal fumarate is commercially available as Vumarity. It is uh, already approved in USA and Canada. And the discontinuation rate in uh, deroximal was much, much less compared to DMF. But the other parameters like lymphopenia others were almost similar. Uh, monomethyl fumarate was also approved as a uh, baffier term. It is exactly similar to DMF, devoid of some of the uh, gastrointestinal side effects. The approved dosage is 95 milligram BD for a week and then 190 milligram subsequently. Now, apart from its use in uh, multiple sclerosis. DMF is being explored for many other indications as well. We know that it was initially approved for psoriasis in Germany and later in the European Union, but it's undergoing trials for various kinds of uh, malignancies like uh, glioblastoma, lymphomas, and then in obstructive sleep apneas, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So various, uh, and then of course for rheumatoid arthritis also. So it's under investigation for various other uh, conditions. Probably in the next few years, we'll come to know its uh, utility in these uh, uh, indications. Now, uh, coming back to the basic question, why should you uh, choose DMF as a DMD? So there are a lot of criteria for choosing uh, disease-modifying therapies in multiple sclerosis. So first thing is the cost of therapy. Uh, DMF, when it was launched initially, uh, it was almost uh, $50,000 in the US for a year. Now we know that uh, the drug is costing around 3,000 rupees as generics per month in our country. Uh, so cost is quite uh, important in therapy because it's a long-term therapy. Efficacy issues are another uh, are, are other important criteria that we think of when we uh, choose DMDs. For somebody with a relatively mild disease, RRMS type, more towards the benign spectrum, a first-line drug would be sufficient. But suppose somebody has a high lesion load, bad prognostic factors, then probably one may not choose a drug like DMF, one may think of a more effective second line drug. So that's what I meant by, uh, you know, uh, matching the efficacy with the type of uh, MS and the severity of MS. The adverse effects uh, profile needs to be kept in mind. Teratogenicity is another important aspect. So generally what we do is if somebody is on DMF, uh, we allow them to, uh, 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 you know, continue the drug till a urine pregnancy test turns positive and the moment you detect it, you stop the drug and then monitor the pregnancy. And post-delivery, as I mentioned earlier, uh, till lactation is there, we probably don't start uh, restart the medicine. And then other criteria will be the route and frequency of administration. Generally, people uh, prefer to take oral medicines at uh, less frequent uh, dosages. Here, probably drugs like rituximab and ocrelizumab score much higher than any other drugs because treatment is quite infrequent. Of course, the most important thing is the patient's preferences. What uh, they would like to choose. Now it's like, you know, you go to a hotel and order something, <laughs> MS treatment has also become like that. People choose what, you know, of course, as doctors, we can 
guide them, but it is their preference. To summarize uh, dimethyl fumarate, uh, it is an effective disease modifying therapy for RRMS. Uh, it's also okay for CIS and rarely it's still useful for some progressive MS where there are a lot of relapses, the progressive relapsing type of MS. But generally it is a good drug for RRMS. Uh, it has better efficacy than other first line disease modifying drugs. It doesn't work for established progressive multi, uh, multiple sclerosis. The PPMS or an established SPMS doesn't work. And it's not an ideal choice for somebody with a highly active MS or very aggressive disease. Uh, as I said, we start the dose at 120 BD and increase to 240 BD. The common adverse effects are flushing, gastrointestinal side effects, lymphopenia, and LFTs. Uh, PML is extremely rare. To avoid some of the side effects, it's taken along with food and uh, the routine aspirin tablets uh, half an hour before taking the medicine. One needs to monitor the complete blood count, the absolute lymphocyte count and LFT after two to three months of starting the medicine and then subsequently six months and periodically or when clinically indicated. And keep in mind the, uh, the, the monitoring with an MRI as well and one should not hesitate to escalate to a second line drug in cases of therapeutic failure. Yes. Thanks for your listening.